You're listening to a podcast from EvidenceNetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Canada and the U.S. are the world's heaviest opioid users, and cases of addiction and overdoses related to the use of the drugs have become a public health emergency in most, if not all, North American jurisdictions, believes Dr. David Yearling, head of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Toronto. I mean, look at SARS. SARS was an emergency back in 2003, killed 44 Canadians. 44 Canadians a week die from opioids. But those deaths are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many people, millions in North America, who are struggling with opioid addiction. Tara Holmes is an epidemiologist at St. Michael's Hospital. She explains that each jurisdiction is tackling the problem individually. The result? A lot of fragmented data that makes it difficult to know the real extent of the crisis. Certain provinces have seen some evidence developed to help characterize the extent to which people are overdosing and dying from prescription opioids or illicit opioids. However, at a national level, we really have no idea the extent to which people are are dying of opioid overdoses. But without that data, we actually can't identify those maybe hot spots in the country and target our programming and our interventions to really try and address the issue. This situation began in the 1990s when opioids started being prescribed more liberally for chronic pain. Most believed it was a safe option, explains Dr. Yearlink. There were, and still are, not very many other drugs that we can use for pain that work very well and are safe. So, you know, it came a push to use opioids more liberally. The crux of the argument was that these drugs could work well, that they did not have significant side effects, that the risk of causing addiction was very, very low. Less than 1% was often bandied about. People started using opioids for extended periods, even though there is little evidence that demonstrates that the benefits of these drugs offset the risks, says Tara Holmes. And so there's actually very little evidence even now to suggest that that is supported by the data, that that is a safe and effective way for managing people's pain. To the dismay of physicians, more people than anticipated became dependent or addicted to opioids. While it might have helped somebody in the first few weeks or month of low back pain, but that tends to wane. I think for many people, they continue to take the drugs because the alternative is developing opioid withdrawal. And then it's a matter of this vicious cycle of people just staying on the drugs. They become self-perpetuating therapies. In order to address this problem, physicians have to face the unpleasant truth that their prescribing practices have contributed to the crisis, says Dr. Heerlink. You know, looking back with the benefit of 20 years of hindsight now, we realize that we really have harmed patients, and we've also introduced into circulation millions upon millions of opioid tablets or patches that have fallen into the wrong hands. It's a direct result of our prescribing. So why don't doctors simply prescribe less opioids? Tara Holmes says that physicians often have limited time and resources to resolve complex chronic pain issues. Opioids are a simple answer. It's a prescription you can write a lot of the time. Patients have heard of them and are asking for them. Often also these drugs are covered by the provincial drug program, whereas if you think of alternatives like physiotherapy and rehabilitation, sometimes those actually come at a cost. And so it's actually a more difficult avenue to pursue, especially if that person has limited financial resources. But all the blame cannot be put only on physicians, says Dr. Yearling, who adds that another contributing factor to this crisis is the influence of pharmaceutical companies who have aggressively marketed opioids as a safe practice. I think it's important to understand that there are billions and billions of dollars at stake here. And the companies that make these drugs, many of whom, by the way, had a role in the genesis of this crisis, and I think they need to face up to it as opposed to just digging in their heels, they continue to not just advocate for the ongoing use of opioids, but they, in some instances, actually obstruct efforts to try and attenuate opioid prescribing. That needs to be confronted head on. The solution to this crisis has to be multifaceted. For starters, prescribing high doses of opioids should be the exception rather than the norm, says Dr. Yearlink. We have to prescribe opioids differently than we historically have. When a dentist gives 60 Percocet tablets to somebody after their wisdom teeth are taken out, I mean, that is a recipe for trouble. Dr. Yearlink is part of a team of physicians currently revising the Canadian guidelines on opioid prescription. He believes these guidelines should be mandated, adding that physicians also need guidance in adopting better practices.
you know, getting doctors to ditch a practice, especially one that they think is helping or one that they can't quite come to grips with is hurting, is sometimes difficult. That's why I think that these changes have to be mandated. The other thing that we could do is give doctors feedback. So, you know, there might be a doctor who's totally well-intentioned and he or she is doing the best they can. And maybe if they got feedback every few months as to how their prescribing measures up to their colleagues prescribing, if I knew, for example, that I was in the top 5% of opioid prescribers, maybe I would reflect on what I was doing. Tara Holmes adds that as doctors reduce the number of prescriptions they hand out for opioids, alternatives need to be offered to patients who are dealing with chronic pain and for those who have become addicted to opioids. So with any changes to accessibility of these drugs or ability for prescribers to actually write prescriptions to these drugs, we need to make sure that there's access to addiction services so that we're not leaving these patients high and dry and they can access services so that they can properly taper down off of these drugs. For Evidence Network, I'm Melanie Holoboski. You've been listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Connect with the latest nonpartisan health research from experts across Canada and around the world, or sign up to receive our free monthly e-newsletter at evidencenetwork.ca. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Evidencenetwork.ca is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Research Manitoba, and the Centre for Healthcare Innovation.